thing. Okay. All right. Thanks for having me. Um, this is not representative of the current state of the subway, except at this particular station. But I thought I thought it was thought it did, did set set the tone for things. Um, and I wouldn't say I gracefully accepted Pavnit's uh, uh, invitation. I hungrily accepted Pavnit's irritation. I keep saying irritation. It's a Freudian slip. <laughs> invitation. Invitation. Right. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about uh, type in the Toronto subway. You don't have to take notes if you don't want to, but something tells me you will, possibly with a fountain pen, based on experience of <laughs> the last two days. Because joeclark.org slash tug, there's already a placeholder page up there. I put all my speaking notes and all the other goodies and so on up on, up on my website. And for other reference, you can just do joeclark.org slash TTC. As you'll hear and as you heard from Pavni, the TTC is the Toronto Transit Commission, which is the local public transit provider. So just joeclark.org slash tug. And feel free to send me an email at any time, joeclark at joeclark.org, or of course, since I'm in the same room with you, you can come up and talk with me. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you about this in a sec, but let me give you a bit more information about myself. I have a 30 year interest in typography, and um, having been here for two days, I, view the, I observe the average age of the room as about 55, and I'm roughly your age, I'm 51. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Moncton, New Brunswick, which for Americans and other foreigners is the province between Quebec and Nova Scotia, north of Maine. It's in the Atlantic provinces. Um, and instead of doing what all the other New Brunswick kids were doing in the 60s and 70s, which is, I guess, shoplifting, sniffing, sniffing glue, I, was, uh, I, was, I, found, I found an interest in typography. You can easily find the, the true genesis of that on my website. But the most important thing is many of you will remember the semi-annual um, broadsheet publication printed on newsprint whose full name was upper and lower case, but was written UNLC, right? There's the, there are digitized archives of that online. It's not, it's not as good as the real thing, but I would hungrily read UNLC, and like everyone else in this room who remembers UNLC, I had multiple free subscriptions to that, right? And it would give them away to unsuspecting people. I'm actually a journalist and author. I spent 10 or 15 years working for, uh, writing for um, daily newspapers and magazines. I have about 400 um, published articles. I wrote for all the big graphic design magazines, you know, print, publish, I, all those things. But of course, design magazines and design criticism are 20th century disciplines that really run, run their course, right? Now, I am quite certain I'm the only person left, the only person, who writes nothing but valid HTML. Um, <laughs> even my speaking notes are in valid HTML, okay? So I think this would be, I thought that would be relevant to um, a room full of nerds who work in computer typesetting, right? And everything has to be delimited and you know properly structured, right? It's not quite true that I mailed that I mailed on Canoes. When I was a young lad in Moncton, I read what must have been the article in Scientific American, which many of you will remember, called Tech and Metafont, right? Um, and it was written about, about this computer typesetting system wildly advanced at the time. Um, and it said um, Donald Newth was a professor at Stanford, so I simply looked up his number and called his uh, office collect. And his <laughs> <laughs> circa, this would have been circa 1980-81. Uh, you know, perhaps one of you can look up when that article was published. We can track it down for sure. Um, I, the, the departmental secretary was uh, very nice and uh, took a message and. Um, sort of put the shiv in by in, in, in subtly correcting the pronunciation. Uh, she told me that she would have Professor Knuth return my call. <laughs> it's like Knopf, you pronounce the K, right? He did call me back, but I wasn't home. Oh. Nonetheless, nonetheless, how cosmic is it that approximately 40 years after I read the article on Tech and Metafont and called Don Knuth, I'm now addressing Tug. <laughs> The literal and figurative tech nerds. Okay, thanks. I never get applause. I love that shit. Okay. Now, there's going to be a tour tonight, type and tile tour. So at 6 p.m., we're going to meet right back here. Well, it can be the, can be the lobby, but not at a subway station. We're going to meet right back here. So if you want to go on a tour of the subway, no more than five stops is probably going to be four. We're going to just take a spin around the loop. I'll show you various eras of TDC signage. It won't take more than an hour. Physical access is somewhat poor. Uh, there is a way to get into Dundas subway by elevator, but it's a pain in the ass. And we will basically be staying at platform level for all the uh, stations we visit. But that's at six if you want to come. Anyone can come. You can bring your friends too. Oh, I shouldn't uh, shouldn't forget. 
You need $3.25 Canadian cash to get into the subway, unless you have a token or a pass, which you probably don't. And if you want to pay by debit or credit card, it's a giant flowchart of options, which we're just going to have to figure out when, when we get there. <laughs> okay, type on the Toronto subway. Here we have uh, Nina Bunyevich's artwork at the Art Gallery of Ontario entitled The Observer, The Ascent, Dundas Subway, Sunny Days. It's one of uh, two images on walls in front of you and behind you when you stand at the gallery. Um, I could have used this picture without permission, but I did get permission. Uh, that is really what the type looks like on the walls of the Dundas subway station, which many of you will have seen while you were here. Um, so it's only one block away. Nina hand drew those letters. That's a hand drawn facsimile of the typeface that really is on the walls at Dundas. Universe. Uh, let me tell you something, type on the Toronto subway is much more than universe on one station wall. So what we're here to discuss today, Subway in Toronto, run by the TTC, the Toronto Transit Commission. The story of type on the Toronto subway is a story about a 50-year-old custom font that nobody else has. A subway lined with washroom tiles. Not quite subway tiles. If you order subway tiles for the, your kitchen backsplash, they're smaller, they're smaller rectangular things, right? Look at the, the dimensions of these things. These are washroom tiles, not subway tiles. It is a system that hired a wayfinding expert, uh, paid him to install and test the new signage system, then ignored it after the new system tested better than the old one. A billion dollar corporation that cloned Massimo Vanilli's work for the New York City subway from 40 years ago, but won't admit it. A billion dollar corporation that refuses to test its signage. And a billion dollar corporation that uses as its main font a Helvetica clone that came free with Corel Draw. <laughs> yes. No one ever laughs at that. You know, listen, you may, be, you may be old nerds who work on computer type city, you're the only people who have ever laughed at that. <laughs> A plus, A plus. Right, so this is the story of a unique typographic heritage that the TDC is totally blowing. Okay. Now, I'm, I touched on this already. If you're all here to talk, if you're all here in town to talk about a computerized typesetting system with a name that's impossible to pronounce and typeset, <laughs> right? Big T, subscript, big E, big X, right? Um, then you're all about correct markup, correct syntax, right? You're all about systems and rigor. Now, does this look rigorous to you? <laughs> does this look like a system to you? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's an aerial sign taped up on the left there. Oh, but I can, I can talk that. Yes, Cooper Black. Yes, the subway system in the largest city in Canada uses Cooper Black. And uh, props to Kevlar over here, Calibri at the bottom. Okay, now let me tell you about the subway. We've got 69 stations on four lines. That is not a lot. We've had a subway since 1954. And from the very start, we had this unique font on the walls. Um, and the walls themselves are interesting. In nearly all cases, the walls are finished in tiles. Originally, we used these glossy, large format vitrolite tiles. Oops. That's more, that's more systematization for you there. Okay, fine. Right. Glossy vitrolite tiles, as I was just saying before, they blew the slides. You have no idea how much I practice these things, right? Anyway, um, okay, you may recall vitrolite from a lot of 1950s and 60s diners. If you look at any photo service, Flickr, Instagram, whatever, you'll find tons of pictures of the few remaining diners left that are encased in these beautiful, glossy, lustrous, deep vitrolite tiles. And as you might imagine from the name, they have, a, they have a glassy appearance. They have a lot of depth, right? All the subway stations at the outset in 1954 were, were uh, tiled in vitrolite. The TDC's custom subway font is sandblasted into the walls in most cases. Now, here's Finch at the top end of the main line. Here's my previous station back in the day, Greenwood. So let's talk about that typeface. It's a geometric sans serif. Uppercase only, with some unusual features. For example, the low waist of the R. The fact that the E and the X are essentially purely geometric forms, which as type designers know is not how you draw an E or an X. And the points of the A, V, M, and N, and W, that extend above and below the cap height and baseline. 
Um, another feature is what we consider these days to be quite a heavy weight uh, for signage, although there are some unusual uh, examples of the lightweight, for which we don't have any drawings. The uh, slide I just showed you of Eglinton Station uses the lightweight. The font doesn't have a name, and nobody knows who designed it. But, but, um, I have what I believe are the original drawings, and they're dated 1960, the subway opened 1954, right? So it's not entirely clear what the origin is, but a little birdie found this um, counterexample in a book of 1950s typeface specimens. Um, that's halfway to the TDC typeface, and as many of you know, uh, similar typefaces often come into being in isolation from each other. Uh, Helvetica and Universe were designed more or less simultaneously with no real communication between the designers, right? So sometimes certain uh, typographic styles or classifications can just be in the air, and this might have been in the air in the 1950s. But there's been some skullduggery in one of the online forums. Uh, someone named simply Brent uh, looked more carefully than I ever did at the signatures on the drawings. That would have been a guinea, right? But I didn't look. Um, and, did, and did some uh, checking. So, as Brent writes, the drawing for the four inch standard alphabet, which I just showed you, indicates that it was drawn by a P but, initial P, B U T T, and reviewed check, slash checked by a W F G Godfrey. A little digging, he continues, leads to William Frederick George Godfrey, born London, England, 1884, died Toronto, 1971. He was a Toronto artist who did engravings and other line drawings, but he was originally trained as an architect. I am guessing, Brent concludes, that Godfrey was the designer and that Butt was the draftsman. So now we have a clue, finally, as to who the originators of this typeface were. Okay, there are different kinds of signed faces that the TDC uses uh, its font on, not just sandblasted sand blasted letters. We have very early white signs with black letters. If we had a longer tour, I could stand you in front of this very sign. Backlit box signs with white type on black. You see the crack in that one. They, they've lasted, so this is on the other line which opened in 1965, sorry. So they've lasted that long, it's not bad. And of course, the most cherished of all, the massive enameled steel plates that have lasted almost without a blemish for 40 years or longer. Some of them are original equipment from 1994. So let's look at a couple of these. Now this is Dufferin Station on the West End. Uh, that'll come up later. Uh, nothing but TDC typeface and uh, a rather kooky arrow there. Uh, this sign is about five foot by three. It is an enameled steel plate. Um, to my knowledge, there is nowhere in Canada that can produce enameled steel of that size anymore. Um, back in the day, the only place you could get it done was Argentina, right? Here's Bay Station, which I think we'll, come, we'll go visit today, so when we have time. Notice that the uh, super long arrow implies that the Cumberland exit is a long <laughs> way away. <laughs> it's, I agree, it's good for a laugh, but it also truly, it clearly indicates you've got a long walk to Cumberland, right? <laughs> Bathurst Station, another sign that's about five foot by three. Uh, difficult to see on the projector, but someone had uh, stuck a decal on there and they had to pry it off. And notice the uh, different type sizes, got the giant uh, arrow again. Now, none of these uh, signs have really been uh, tested, but they seem to be mostly functional. Nonetheless, the TBC is run by jumped up motor men and engineers and old guys who think that anything related to print or design is girly and decorative. You know what these people are like, right? They think design is the icing on the cake. Right? They do not understand that design is the recipe for the cake. They do not understand that the cake is design, right? And you can't reason with these people, as I found out over the last decade. Um, nonetheless, in the 1970s, the TDC started to pollute its uh, nice, tidy, uniform system. Um, they extended the first line that I mentioned, uh, north and also south around the loop downtown, which we're going to visit today. And they opened another line, a crosstown line, the one that I showed you at Greenwood is at, um, which had the original, original tiles and original fonts in, um, a uh, very special color scheme that matches itself, that mirror, mirrors itself on two, two different sides of the line. After that, they renovated some of the original subway stations on the first line. They tore out, or just covered up, most of the vitrolite tiles in all but one of them, and replaced them with uh, haphazard tiles and haphazard fonts. I got good and bad examples here. 
So Dundas, if you visited it, really is chartreuse now. It wasn't originally. It was yellow vitrolite tiles uh, when it was opened in 1954. It's this horrific. Those are those are those are true um, subway tiles in the classic sense, right? And they are literally chartreuse. But Rosedale Station, uh, which is just north of downtown, which is in a multi-million dollar neighborhood, as nice as the name, is uh, a pretty good uh, rendition. Um, those are actually uh, rhomboidal or triangle or like you know, diamond-shaped uh, tiles, three-dimensional or textured, and of course that's universe there. Dupont is a special case. It is not Dupont. It is Dupont. That's uh, on the extension of the uh, original line. Um, these customized teensy tiny hexagonal tiles um, cover all the surfaces. They bend all the way, way around the surfaces, and there's a giant mosaic tile artwork of uh, 60 feet uh, tall by 30 feet wide of um, an underground onion and its, and its flower. Um, this is this station is being renovated for wheelchair accessibility, and wisely they've uh, rehired the original architect to match things as best as possible. So some optimism there. Uh, later, they opened a suburban line out in the neighborhood known as Scarborough using toy trains. That's for real. Um, it uses signage in Helvetica on curved metal blades. Generally a very nice installation. It just doesn't match anything else in the system. Then they opened a couple of extra stations here and there, also using Helvetica. There's North York Center. And all the while behind the scenes, they were replacing signage that wasn't sandblasted into the walls with whatever they could get their hands on, mostly Helvetica. And then, as we'll find out shortly, they spent nearly a billion bucks on a new five station subway line to nowhere, a subway line to nowhere, also using fake Helvetica. So, what we have here now is a completely unplanned mixture of signs in the true TTC typeface and signs in Helvetica, fake Helvetica, Universe, and Aerial. Now, it's been very hard to get this point across in TDC, although you know, there's been a bit of a glass nose, there's been a bit of a thaw, but historically it's been difficult to communicate to them when, that when your signage is all hither and yon like this, then people get lost, right? Especially tourists and people who haven't learned the system the hard way, right? And B, your entire subway system looks like shit. And people are encouraged not to believe anything your signs say, right? A lack of systemization breeds distrust, right? Now, as for not believing what the signs say, sometimes that's actually true. So let's look at this sign at Bathurst Station. It says westbound trains, buses, and streetcars. The problem is the only thing that moves westbound from Bathurst is a train. The buses and streetcars all go north and south. But it quite clearly says westbound trains, buses, and streetcars. Right? You cannot get on a westbound bus, even if you follow that sign. <laughs> right? So a lack of systemization and a lack of uh, adult supervision leads to mistakes like this, right? You know, I, I feel like I've, you know, I've, 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 I've talked to typographers, I've talked to other people lots of times, right? I feel like this is, honest to God, this is the first audience that understands that you have to be a hard ass about things. There, there have to be rigid rules and systems, otherwise um, people just freelance things with the, 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 their own opinions, their own feelings, well I just want to put this sign up, right? And one of the reasons why they do that is they want to express their own individuality, they want to rebel against the system. Well, in a scenario like this, you must rigidly adhere to the system, right? Otherwise, you don't have a system. And our first question from the audience. Yeah, I was just going to point out, I used to comment on the lines as to whether streetcar is one word or two. Um, it's not one word not a, word sign. That's correct. That's correct. Circa 1954, it would have been two words. Good catch. Now, I've been trash talking the TDC, but along the way, they have tried to fix it. Uh, in the early 90s, the TDC hired Paul Arthur to develop a new signage system. He was a British-born Canadian graphic designer. He died in 2001. He was a true pioneer in signage and wayfinding. And as an aside, you all understand those are two different things. If you read about this field at all, or, you, or listen to podcast interviews, people always say signage and wayfinding is one word, right? As though wayfinding were a, a nice $5 uh, synonym for signage. Incorrect. Signage is, of course, a system of objects. Wayfinding is um, a psychological process, right? Wayfinding is a process of the mind. So to find your way, you may use signage, but they're really not the same thing. Nonetheless, keeping those two concepts separate, Paul Arthur was a pioneer in that. 
He co-wrote a couple of books, and the most important of which is Wayfinding, People, Science, and Architecture, which you can easily find on Amazon or at many libraries. That's actually a library copy. Uh, TDC's, oh, oh, and the best thing he did, you may even remember this, he designed all the pictograms for uh, Expo 67 in Montreal. That was Paul Arthur. And uh, if you walk by any mailbox uh, in Toronto, um, all the Canada Post graphics are Paul Arthur. Right. Okay, uh, circa about 92, TDC spent about a quarter million dollars coming up with new designs with Paul Arthur at the helm. Going back to those pictographs, Lance Wyman helped out. Uh, you may know him from the Mexico City Olympics pictograms. Right? And for the TDC, Lance drew pictograms, or pictographs, take your pick, for uh, all subway stations. They were never implemented. It's still a good idea. Um, they took uh, St. George Station and remade half of it. It's an interchange between <laughs> two lines. The entire east end of the station on all levels was made over with the new Paul Arthur signs, uh, while the west end was left intact, right? which gave you an AB comparison. Some of the features of Paul's system. He used Gill Sands. Not a good idea. Paul was English. Um, and this was really a holdover from his childhood, um, covers of uh, Penguin paperbacks, that sort of thing. Um, he considered all ser sans serifs to be equally legible, which obviously they are not. Uh, Gill Sands, in this case, was too light a weight for signage, um, though they did expand the tracking. And as ever, there is the notorious difficulty of differentiating I, L, and 1, especially in Gill Sands, because the original Eric Gill drawing, the one is simply a verbal stroke, right? Some of Paul's uh, drawings have a vertical stroke one, and others have a, the correct numeral one in, their, in, the, in the Gil Sands usage. Okay, next point in the system. Subway lines would no longer have names. The names of the subway lines are ridiculous in Toronto. They tend to relate to the names of the streets under which the subway runs, except not always. So we've got the Young University Spadina line. That's three names for one line. The Bloor Danforth line. The Scarborough RT. Scarborough's a neighborhood, not a street and RT just stands for Rapid Transit, and the Shepherd Line. In, the new, in this new system, lines would each get a color and a number, and the color would be written out in words so that anyone with a color deficiency or color blindness would not have to rely on the actual shape. Every station would have a strap line above the tracks on the train wall side in the line color with the name written out and the station's custom pictograph. So in principle, even if you couldn't read, you could still find your way around the subway. They tested the St. George prototype with four groups, the general population, meaning writers without disabilities who could read English, the visually impaired, a multicultural group, that is English as a second language speakers, and an English speaking group with a low level of literacy who are often students. The low vision people hated all the signs, but they hated the new ones less, and all the other groups preferred the new signs. It was just an opinion survey not a test of tasks and performance. Nonetheless, the new signs were deemed better. So the TDC ignored them, literally. It would have cost about $8 million to retrofit the entire system, but the Toronto Transit Commission, the actual commission, never voted on doing that. It was never brought to the elected commissioners. It was killed internally, and there are no records of how that happened. I know because I checked all the archives. There are no records of how the system was completely buried. And almost all the Paul Arthur signs were simply left in place. They're still there. Let's see, 1992, is that 14 years later? Or is it 22 years later? It's 22, isn't it? Right, they're still there 22 years later. And you'll see some of them today on the tour. But in a curious turn of events, as of three years ago, the TDC started phasing out line names in favor of numbers and colors. And obviously the numbers in, are in Helvetica, obviously. And <laughs> Just as obviously this male-run organization picked a set of colors that colorblind people can't necessarily <laughs> tell apart. Because four to eight percent of the male population and some females have a color deficiency, usually on the red, green, orange axis. But over and over again, the TDC picks green, yellow, and orange as colors. So technically, the Young University Spadina line is now simply line one, white, Helvetica numeral one on a green field, right? And, and the Bloor Danforth line is two, black, Helvetica two, on a yellow field. So the point here is that nearly 20 years on, um, the TDC did adopt one of Paul's ideas, but in the true Toronto fashion, they half-assed it all the way. Then there was the Shepherd subway. Uh, TDC wanted to expand our piddling little subway lines in the 1990s. The plan was to run two new lines across midtown Toronto, one on 
Eglinton Avenue West, I already saw Eglinton Station, and on Shepherd Avenue East and West. But then a new provincial government was uh, voted into power that hated Toronto. They tried to scotch the whole project. They did kill the Eglinton subway. We're rebuilding it now as an LRT line. Uh, but they funded the, uh, the Shepherd uh, subway for five stops going east into the middle of nowhere. And those five stations on the Shepherd line cost $933 million to build. Now, for a nice new subway line, you need nice new signs. So guess what? TDC ignored the Paul Arthur system they already had in their files and cooked up something in-house. They threw together a couple of prototype signs and installed them, of course, at St. George, where you install all prototypes. And of course, they're still up today, and the biggest hype on those signs is in Ariel. <laughs> That's, uh, oh, I don't know, foot and a half tall cap height. Oh, and did you notice that they couldn't even construct the lowercase g correctly? That is not an aerial lowercase g. And how do you even have to construct the g? Don't you just type the g on the computer and then it produces an outline that you just fill in? Nonetheless, this is what they did it. So again, to recap, St. George has got more than half of its original signs, signs from the 80s anyway, plus many of the Paul Arthur signs, plus these things, right? These prototypes are all still up there today. Okay, so they put together these fake Helvetica signs and ran them by a dozen people. That was their user test. And from that, they wrote a 350-page instruction manual on how to clone Massimo Vanelli's designs for the New York City subway in the 60s. So here's the 2002 version of the manual. It was the 2014 version of the manual. Fundamentally, no difference. Why would we do such a thing? Well, of course, Toronto has an inferiority complex, right? Still today, today it's still true today. Right? Deep down, we wish we were as good as New York. And the fact that we're better than New York in a lot of things you know, does not cut the mustard, right? New York is the summit of a mountain we can never reach, right? But it also means that anything New York does is axiomatically the best, and we have to follow it. And that means the use of Helvetica for transit signage. Now, in the 1960s, Massimo Vignelli chose Helvetica because he's an arch, he was an arch modernist, right? Although half of you will want to put your hands up and say he didn't choose Helvetica, he used standard or accidents grotesque because Helvetica was not available at the time for the formats he wanted, right? You should read all about that in Paul Shaw's book, Helvetica and the New York City Subway System. In fact, that's the title. But anyway, we don't live in the 1960s. Sadly, Massimo Vanilli is no longer with us. We have engineered sign fonts now. We can design new engineered sign fonts if we need them, right? And we know a whole lot more about testing, right? And no offense to half you in the audience, but the TDC are visual literates and they're Windows users. Right? And they have no taste. They have no taste. Their powers of analysis begin and end with, I can read it, why are we having this conversation? And it looks clean. Right? And that first one I gave you is, that's for real. The, 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 the response to, by the engineers and jumped up motorman who run the place to any discussion of typography is, I can read it, why are we having this conversation? Okay, so what do we have in the Shepherd subway? Well, wall to wall to Helvetica and half the, t half the time it's backlit or electronically scrunched. Okay, that sign is not backlit. Can't tell them on the projector. But it looks like something you'd find out of New York, right? Um, the, well, actually, here's uh, something that Paul Arthur would complain about. Uh, on three, tell me what the name of this color is. One, two, three. Magenta. Good guess. Do you think ordinary people are gonna say magenta for that? They're probably gonna say pink, but it's not actually pink. If I brought you up there, you'd see it. It's not actually pink. As Paul describes in People's Science and Architecture, right, you can, the only colors you can use are ones, first of all, that colorblind people can distinguish, and they're colors that everyone instantly agrees on the name for. You know, blue, yellow, green, white, black, right? There's it may be purple, maybe, right? So this is some oddball color of pink, but that is actually the color designation for the line. But the strap on, it's just a strap line on the top. It looks like decoration. In fact, it's the color designation for the shepherd line. Okay, that is a backlit box sign. And it seems to be telling you that there are three places you can go to Young Street, and that's how it's pronounced by the way, Young, uh, Harlandale Avenue and buses. Okay, fine. Right. Now look at this one, another backlit sign. How many destinations are there? It appears to be three, Shepherd Avenue, the YMCA and Keniston Gardens, or is it Shepherd Avenue and the Keniston Gardens YMCA? Right? Something, something as simple as a hanging indent that's all this problem. But again, they don't know anything about that. And one more. You can see that the uh, strap line runs the entire length of the subway platform above the, above the trains. It has a subway map on it, this sort of thing.
Okay. Now, all that looks really pleasingly uniform and so on, but for a computer typesetting crowd, I shouldn't have to explain to you why Helvetica is a shitty choice for signage, right? But, in case you don't know, let me let you know. So in Helvetica, all the standard confusable characters like I, L, and 1 are still confusable. The numerals are really confusable, right? Um, the whole thing sets too tightly together by default. When you're at a distance from a piece of text and optical phenomenon that Kevlar told us about the other day called crowding, reduces the legibility of characters that are spaced tightly together. Helvetica sets too close together by default. And if you notice on the original 1950s and 1960s, wall, like, uh, sandblast into the walls, original TDC type, letters are widely spaced, right? They knew what they were doing. It's third of an M spacing, right? They, their instincts were correct there. Okay, uh, this is one of the uh, illustrations from our friend, the now retired type designer, Eric Speakerman. This is one of his explanations about why Helvetica doesn't work. Um, top two lines are Helvetica and Arial, and, and the bottom two lines are FF Meta and FF Unit. So he would like you to look most closely at the uh, smallest signs, and this is uh, sizes. This is actually a pretty good uh, test case because it allows you resolution, right? Um, more relevant in a transit context, this is also from Speakerman. Um, the, uh, the, the thesis he's trying to prove here is that I, L, and 1 can be distinguished in different typefaces as long as you don't pick Helvetica. Uh, the interesting thing is, uh, while Islington is a borough or a neighborhood in London, as many of you may know, it's also a subway station in Toronto. It's in the West End. We have a subway station on a street called Islington. So this actually works for Toronto. Top two are Noya, Helvetica, and Ariel. The third one is Avenir. And uh, the bottom three are variations of the same typeface, uh, Fira, Meta, and Officina, uh, really fundamentally that's the, it's really the only thing that uh, Eric can draw, just like there are 20 versions of uh, Palatino, there's really 20 versions of these things, right? Um, and contrary to what some might immediately conclude, you don't have to have feet uh, or bars on the top and bottom of the eyes to do an officina at the bottom. It seems to be sufficient to differentiate the, the lowercase l with a curve on the bottom. It seems to be sufficient. Okay, now even if we didn't have evidence already that Helvetica is a lousy choice for signage, uh, my business partner, Mark Sullivan, and I demonstrated it for another transit system here in town, Go Transit, the commuter rail system. If you took the UP Express, the Union Pearson Express, in from the airport, that was Go Transit, although Tyler Brule did all the design on that for in a $4.7 million contract. So what we did was we put together some Helvetica and uh, uh, six alternative typefaces in positive and negative sharp and blurry versions. We uh, uh, constructed three foot by two inch uh, boards and tacked them up on easels all the way around the office and walked, uh, walked everyone in the room through these different variations. And in a demo like that, if you've ever done a design demo from a large crowd of people, there'll always be one person who is oppositional defiant about it because they have to save face within the organization. So you just let that person vent and you persuade the rest of them, right? And you know, the majority concluded that Helvetica didn't work um, this is FF Transit by, wait for it, Eric Speakerman. So ultimately, Go Transit, if you go down to Union Station and take the train, not the subway, the train, you'll see uh, signs in a font other than Helvetica. They picked the wrong one, but they're not using Helvetica. Okay, now, so I'm bringing, to bring this to your attention because all the signs in the Shepherd subway, the five station Shepherd subway are in Helvetica. And the most interesting fact is the man who oversaw the development of those signs couldn't use them. Um, my acquaintance Bob Brent was the manager of the TDC at the time. Uh, later on, he had a hip operation and he had to use a wheelchair and a walker for a really long time. Um, he was using the, the paratransit service that picks you up and delivers you door to door called Wheeltrans for a long time and la later started using the accessible features of the conventional system, of which there are a few. But on, on two different occasions, Bob, who managed and oversaw all the signage at Shepherd, on the Shepherd line, was at Shepherd Station and could not find his way out in a wheelchair or a walker. The manager who oversaw all these new signs could not use them to find his way out <laughs> at Shepherd Station. Right? Now, TDC did give us a stop to the past at uh, Shepherd Subway. Those are just concrete walls, by the way. They had to uh, trim the budget because of the hostile provincial government that I mentioned before. But it looks pretty good. These It looks exactly like a concrete wall. It's not pretending to be anything but a concrete wall. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite serious about that. It's, you know, you may, many of you may be familiar with brutalist architecture, right? You, things that are unapologetically concrete can be quite nice. Um, 
and I recommend, forgive the vulgarity, I recommend the, the most interesting Tumblr on Tumblr, the only one that isn't porn, right, even though it has a vulgar name, Fuck Yeah Brutalism. May I suggest the, 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 the Tumblr, Fuck Yeah Brutalism, has 300,000 followers, the, the, the architecture student who runs this thing um, looks through old architecture books and scans photographs of amazing brutalist buildings all over the world. May I suggest that to you? So, the Shepherd subway has concrete walls and they look like concrete walls, and that's fine. So you see here there's an attempt to use the original TDC typeface, right? Except it's not sandblasted into the walls, and it's uh, set as close together as Helvetica. There's no third of an M spacing. You know, like they kind of blew that, right? Now, what's happening these days? Well, a lot of things uh, are happening that I wouldn't have anticipated uh, a few years ago. First, now TDC actually has a design department. They're even on Twitter, TDC Design, look them up. Um, and I did some work for them. I mean, it was a bone throw to me, thrown to me. It was a piddly little job, 10 grand job. Um, and they didn't like the results. Um, you can read the report on my website, it's joeclark.org slash TDC, you can read that. Um, anyway, I set up um, a few uh, candidate tasks, uh, common ones, unusual ones, and rare ones. And I did a test that to see if I could carry out those tasks using only the existing signage. And most of the time I couldn't. Um, this design department uh, does not inspire a lot of confidence. They spent an entire year being the world's only Helvetica truthers. They were literally saying to people, in writing, on Twitter, and in their own manual, that Swiss 721 is the real typeface and Helvetica is the clone. Yes, yes, yes. TVC wanted us to, TVC Design wanted us to believe that those Swiss dudes who designed a typeface called Neue Haas Grotesque later designed a successor font called Swiss 721 and after that, there was another successor typeface called Helvetica, right? No, 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 right? That didn't happen. Germans didn't roll, win World War II. None of that happened, right? Now, another thing that happened is, that it took place is um, one of the TDC's junior architects um, essentially self-assigned the task of solving the problem of uh, wall coverings, because of course we don't have the original nice vitrolite tiles anymore. So they did a test down at St. Andrew's Station on King Street, as you can see. Um, these are actually giant, about eight foot tall, um, uh, enameled steel covered uh, panels. And I, to this day, I have no idea where they got them manufactured because, as I mentioned, there was no capacity to manufacture them in Canada, but here we are. Uh, their first installation didn't work. Um, the panels warped, but their version 2.0 did work. So now we have a really nice material that looks a lot like vitrolite tiles because it's glossy and has a depth to it, but it's almost indestructible. And in these installations, they're duplicating the Aboriginal typography from 1954. So this is during installation. Uh, this is only last summer. That's the original yellow vitrolite tile that they had to expose, right, to install these things. And these are the new panels down on Queen Street. So that's pretty good. Um, another thing they're doing that's not fantastic, but it had you know, it gives a bit of free song pleasure to the typography nerds. It was, um, they, were, they had to uh, dig out all those horrible new tiles and seemingly put them back up six weeks later. And the whole purpose of this process was to make bigger ad caissons, C-A-I-S-S-O-N-S, which is of course the frames that the ads go in, right? But during the time that they had, that they removed the, the, the crappy uh, 20, uh, 20, late 20th century tiles, you can see the original vitrolite tiles behind them, right? So this is these are the old, this is the crappy, you know, late 20th century tiles, and these are the original 1954 tiles with the original type. This one's at uh, College Station. Uh, rather surprisingly, Wellesley just has Helvetica sort of spray painted onto it. We couldn't figure that out. We also can't figure out why, why it's concrete. Um, back to College, that's one of the uh, original arrows. Of course, someone has to graffiti on top of the arrow there, of course, right? Um, if TDC is renovating subway stations, they have to anyway because they have to be made wheelchair accessible. But while they're doing that, sometimes they're doing a full gut and reno, right? So one of the ones they did um, is Dufferin. Remember the sign from Dufferin Station before? Uh, they use their own, when they do these renos, they use their own in-house version of the TDC font, right? Uh, but at Dufferin, they got the N backwards. <laughs> which seems impossible because, of course, it's not, a, it's not a transparent overlay, right? Um, this isn't an overhead projector with a slide that you got backwards you can flip over, right? This is actually a tile that had to be installed. So in all likelihood, it was simply rotated 180 degrees, right? So incredibly enough, 
uh, civilians noticed this. It made the papers. It was, this is actually the photo from the Toronto Star. <laughs> and it was, it was uh, fixed almost immediately. I have no idea how, how this happened, but it did, right? <laughs> and one more thing, even after, you know, even many years after they should have known better and after they hired me and well past any possible point where they could have known this was a bad idea. One year ago, last summer, some idiot gave the order to rip out the destination signs on the Blue Danforth Lines uh, trains and replace them with, wait for it, Ariel. So, the destination signs now on the Blue Danforth Line are in Ariel caps. Previously, they were in Futura and old industrial gothics of the sort that you'd find in, um, that Heffler and Frere Jones like to, likes to turn into million dollar uh, custom fonts. This is for real, right? Um, and those original um, roll up signs were a much better historical approximation from the era of the subway, 1954 and 1965. But this is really what we're stuck with now. We have aerial destination signs. So, to conclude, uh, Type and the Toronto Subway is the story of just how much of a mess you can make without adult supervision. Uh, <laughs> they started out with something nobody else had. And then, through a combination of ignorance and bad taste, they spent 50 years tinkering with it and diluting it, up to and including last year. So thanks for listening. Before we do our tour, three hour, two and a half hours from now, uh, may, many of you may have questions, or none of you may, in which case I'll just sit down and have a cup of tea. <laughs> questions, comments? John? Um, obviously, you've spent most of your time in Cabbage Town looking around the subway, but have you looked at other subway systems or other transit systems in other parts of the country or Found some places that are well done, or clearly designers have done a good job, and their ideas were listened. Two words, Montreal. <laughs> Just from Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> Two words, Montreal. Right um, now, this you can see the YouTube videos. The English one has kind of a walkie translation. They're actually renovating some of the um, other some of the signs that aren't sandblasted into the walls in Montreal. And they're using FF Transit by Speakerman. Right, so they did, they've done a good job there. But um, the funny thing is I went to school in Montreal, I actually went to McGill Linguistics, but I was too young to understand what, it, what I was surrounded by, because the, the Montreal Metro was this amazing thing with um, concrete and tiles and uh, 1960s art and architecture, which is still intact today. It's just, it really, it's, it's truly amazing. I was too young to appreciate it. I look back on it now and, 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 uh, and marvel at it. But the easy answer to your question is Montreal. Besides, that's fundamentally that's the only other subway system in Canada, right? To, I'm answering your question a bit too narrowly. There are other places, for example, um, the Subte in uh, Buenos Aires, uh, designed start to finish by a designer whom I also gave a subway tour to by the name of Ronald Shakespeare. Yes, Ronald Shakespeare. So if you uh, Google images of the Subte, which is S-U-B-T-E, you can do that right now. You'll find amazing enameled steel signs, and everything's done in Frutiger. Perhaps not not the best choice because the IL one problem, right? Okay, but uh, it's a it's a ruthlessly imposed system. Someone over there, great question. Uh, my question has just been answered. I was going to say I think Montreal is standardized compared to Toronto. <laughs> yeah, and Montreal, it's all universe condensed caps, yeah. right? Which semi-legible, but it's all, at least, at least it's a system, and of course it's all French slash Swiss, so it's <laughs> consistent. It's consistent, right? Yeah, you can say it spiritually. Uh, hang on, Bruce. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, I can ask you a question that's a little bit off topic. What's it like having the same name as a former prime minister? <laughs> it's no big deal. Only old people remember. It's actually, it's it, uh, the right honorable uh, Charles Joseph Clark was prime minister of Canada for a short time, circa 1979. And he was known universally as Joe Clark. And same spelling as me and everything. So really only, only old people remember that. So I, I get that question once a year now at most. It's actually, it's actually worse. The problem is having two monosyllabic names that especially with, um, that begin with, with consonants. My name sounds a bit harsh, especially when I call it and Joe Clark. It's too, it sounds a bit too harsh. That's the real problem. Not, not, the, not the similarity of the names of the prime minister. So a real question next. Yeah, uh, actually, it's not a question, rather a comment. Mm -hmm. You say that uh, Toronto has an inferiority complex uh, with respect to New York, and I must say that this flop 
the subway it's uh, a repetition of a similar clock with new york subway there is a famous uh, story about maps of new york subway they ordered and they had really beautiful maps by vinelli and it was and they they spent a lot of money just to scrap it and put something horrible instead of this. It wasn't per se scrap. You should read the, the, the Transit Maps blog yeah. and the Transit Maps books. Yeah. This history is, is well known, actually. And of course, Vanilli would insist that he didn't draw a map. He drew a diagram. Yeah. But it, it was actually it was actually up in the subways. It was used. It was used, unlike the Paul Arthur Signer system, which was not used, right? It was truly used. It's, but then but they, but then they, they got cold feet, as we say in English. They got cold feet. That's correct. But apparently, the the current generation one, is a two, the 2016 version yeah. is apparently much better than the previous yeah. versions, right? Because they're, they're, they're slowly learning. Anyone else? Yeah. Maybe back. Uh, do, you, uh, do you have any knowledge about what's going on in Ottawa with their signage for their new... Uh, <laughs> Nil. Oh, okay. Feel, free to, feel free to send me a mail in your own pictures. Feel free. Or, or pass Joe's name on. You're there. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. See, I, I'm, I, I, you, no, no. If, if there were a transit agency that wanted to redo its signs, probably they'd have, they'd have to hire a, a, a proper firm, well, like a, them, applied good. wayfinding, or I, like I know Tim Fenley at applied wayfinding, do that sort of thing. I couldn't help them. Besides, I'd also tell them exactly what was wrong with their system, and they don't want to hear that. <laughs> Fundamentally, they don't, right? Fundamentally. So it's approaching, approaching engineering clients is a problem. Okay, go ahead. I thought it was an LRT, if I may. Yeah, LRT, LRT. LRT. Yeah. I, let's hope they don't blow it. Okay. Uh, other questions while I got you? Okay, thanks for coming. And those of you who are interested, six o'clock.